everyone, and thanks for the introduction. Um, the truth is that this talk is going to talk a little bit more than about marine ice cliff instability, and my history has been really in ice sheet processes. But increasingly, I have been interested in um, understanding and linking how we understand climate change broadly, but also sea level rise, and what we actually do with that information, and what we do with that information even at the community level. And this title slide that I have here has got a picture of a group of undergrad students that I took with um, my colleague Perry and a few other faculty here at the University of Michigan um, to Greenland in an attempt to kind of figure out how we can broaden the community, our community so that we aren't quite um, as, so that we have a little bit more diversity. And it was partly through that and partly through students and through a number of initiatives that I sort of became a lot more interested in connecting the science that we do with the actions and community level engagement that we need to do actually on the ground. And so this talk is gonna be a little bit maybe more interactive than some of you are used to or maybe even hoping for. Um, and so let me just start by, and you can use the chat if you want. Um, let me just ask everyone a simple question. It's a question that I get asked a lot um, and you can substitute different locations. Um, but yeah, go ahead, open your chat. And I just, I'm curious what you think, um, when do you expect sea level to exceed one meter in, we'll pick New York City. I realize that some of you are in New York, some of you are far away. And do you think it will exceed one meter by say 2050, 2100, by 2150, or perhaps after 2150 or, or never? And I don't know if everyone can see the chat, I can. Um, there's a number of Ds, Cs, Ds, um, so by 2150, after 2150, um, number of people have chimed in. Thank you very much. Um, wow, very specific, 2075, impressive level <laughs> of precision there. Um, okay, so in general, people think um, 2150, after 2150, I have not seen anyone answer never. Um, and very few people think that we need to worry about by 2050 and probably not even by 2100. Um, now it's an interesting thing, which I do this question a lot in different locations. And the answer that I get for this very much depends on the community that I ask, whether you're a bunch of glaciologists, sea level experts, and very, very different if you're actually adaptation professionals. So we're all looking at different informations when we're thinking about these things. And so I'm interested in New York. Um, that's actually as close to an ancestral home as I have. And I just want to take you through a little bit of some quick history about the city. And for those of you who don't know, this is a beautiful image that's recreated from a book that I just love of the original island of Manhattan, where prior to colonization and settlers, there was about 15,000 Lenape living there. Um, primarily farmers. And what's kind of amazing when we think back to prior to colonization is this would have been an extraordinarily ecologically diverse place um, with about the equivalent number of ecosystems as Yellowstone, 55 versus 65, in about 1% of the area. So this would have been an absolutely spectacular place to visit. And settlers noted in some of their writings that you could actually smell the flowers before you saw the island. Um, it would have been a beautiful, spectacular place. There would have been dolphins and whales um, frolicking in the ocean. And so it was a fairly spectacular place to visit. We would have probably considered it one of our national parks if we had not actually built upon it. But of course, we did build upon it. So as settlers arrived, there was various battles, if you care about that, between the Dutch and the British, and the population started to grow. And this is kind of this old map that I happen to really love that's showing you the topography of New York. And the city had all these creeks and streams. And as the population kind of became more and more urban, there was eventually a massive cholera epidemic and around, right around 1819, and that swept through the region. This is actually not that uncommon from other cities within the United States, but also Europe and globally, is that as the population grows, 
you have this problem of what to do with your wastewater. And the response of New York, the response of many other cities, Pittsburgh, others, was actually to build one of the very first sewer systems of the city. Now, the way sewer systems work is they use gravity. And so what happened, and this is true for New York, is true for a lot of other cities, is they ended up using a lot of streams and creeks and they covered them. And they use that to build the city's first sewer system. And if you want to understand the topography of a major city, if you want to understand where the streams and creeks used to be before they were covered in concrete and other things, you want a map of the sewer system because they were smart enough to recognize that you follow gravity. So the city's getting developed, the population is growing, and in about 1853, land was set aside for what will eventually become Central Park. And it's interesting to look at some of the original reasoning because a pretty clear element of the motivation for Central Park is they want to become a world-class city, yes, but also as the city is becoming more and more dense and urban, they recognize their need for recreation, health, and even air quality. So the idea is you'll have this big track of land, which New Yorkers can then use as a place for recreation that will not be built. For those of you who know that history, you'll also know that that location of Central Park was not empty. Seneca Village, which was a fairly middle-class black community, was forcibly displaced from that area to make way for that park. And this is kind of gonna be a theme of a lot of the infrastructure investments that we think in these different places. So we're now building this park, population is continuing to grow. And this is maybe something that I find both fascinating and somewhat a somewhat personal connection to is that as the city expanded, people filled in the ocean using landfill and other things to expand what was the shoreline of Lower Hatton out into the ocean and the rivers. And so the, the current shoreline of Manhattan, especially the lower portion of Manhattan, is much more extensive than it would have been. And the original Lenape probably wouldn't recognize that portion at all, nor would the original settlers. And so as this region is expanding, it is actually farther away from Midtown, the center of commerce. And so you end up with cheap rent. Now I realize for anyone who's from New York or from the region, the idea of cheap rent probably doesn't sound right. Um, but the Lower East Side of Manhattan particularly attracted a huge immigrant community in cheap tenement housing in Lower Manhattan. And that is in fact where my ancestors eventually ended up and with three generations living in a two bedroom, one bathroom apartment. And again, to come back to kind of the connection to climate change, Hurricane Sandy had a pretty devastating effect on the city, New Jersey area. And one of the things that my environmental engineering colleagues pointed out to me is that places that were reclaimed ocean were especially devastated. And the original outline of the island of Manhattan was largely left, um, was largely left undamaged. Not entirely, of course, and infrastructure damage was extensive across the entire region. But again, this reclaimed land was particularly um, hard hit. So present day, um, my family eventually moved out of those tenements. Um, my grandfather grew up in, a, in, a, in the Brooklyn Hebrew Orphanage in Brooklyn. Um, and Lower Manhattan today is not the site of these tenements. And in fact, my family made a pilgrimage there so that I could show them where some of um, their relatives grew up. And today, Lower Manhattan, those of you who visit it, would have been one of the most exclusive and wealthiest neighborhoods in New York City. As I mentioned before, it's also got some extraordinary low elevation. If you look towards some of the other boroughs, Bronx is amongst the poorest, amongst the most diverse, and it also has some of the higher elevations in the city. Not maybe the highest elevations, but for a lot of reasons, it has some of the higher elevations. 
And so as we think about the expansion of Manhattan and how our modern built landscapes are going to evolve, we need to think about the fact that sea level rise is certainly gonna affect lower Manhattan. It's going to affect the entire island. But we also have to think about the fact that real people live there. And although most of my family has since moved away from the city, in fact, out from Brooklyn to eventually Elmont in the aftermath of World War II, where they were able to make use of programs that were not necessarily available to black and brown people because of redlining and things like that, my family was able to build up intergenerational wealth. It's probably one of the few reasons why I, I was able to eventually attend university and end up here. And so just a couple of the quick takeaways is there's about 18 million people living in modern day New York within on the order of 10 meters of sea level, okay? This is not unique to most coastal cities. And so we could expect expand it to think about all of the people who are coastal. But as New York is kind of a microcosm of a lot of other things, it's not just the people who are right next to sea level that are threatened, because the people who are right next to sea level are going to move as disasters increase, and they are going to move to places that are higher elevation, thereby potentially displacing people. And that will perhaps happen first within the city, but then eventually we expect people to start moving elsewhere. I am currently in an arbor, which is about 45 minutes from the city of Detroit, the beautiful city of Detroit. And again, this is a place that we don't expect to see massive sea level rise effects. We do expect to see immigration because we have a mild climate and ample fresh water. Okay, another important point to think about this as we're thinking about adaptation is that a lot of major infrastructure and investments have displaced indigenous black and brown people. So just from the original colonization of the island, of course, involves the forced removal of local populations to the development of the highway system, which often cleaved vulnerable and poor communities, Central Park. And so again, when we're thinking about infrastructure and the investments that we want to make to make New York City and San Francisco and all of our other coastal cities, both within the US and globally resilient to sea level rise and climate change, we also have to take into account the fact that a lot of those changes have not universally benefited the populations. And this is also a pretty crucially important point to think about as we're considering adaptation, is that the landscape that was engineered in many of these communities was engineered for a very different climate. So those creeks and rivers that have been covered, that provided a very efficient drainage system as we move into a climate that might have more extreme precipitation. Again, those sewage systems might need to evolve. We can think about the subway systems and all these other things. And then of course, what I wanna focus on a little bit more is sea level. And the fact that New York City and many of our coastal communities were engineered specifically for a sea level that's increasingly unlikely in the coming 50 to 100 years and longer. So to think a little bit about sea level, it's useful just to back up. And I recognize all of you are experts in this area. And so you'll just indulge me for a couple slides while I just step through a couple of mechanisms that control sea level. And the first one is, for thinking about sea level, what we really care is about regional sea level. And the very ground can go up or down. So the ground's going to go up or down, and that's going to cause changes in sea level. The ground can go up and down because of tectonics in some places, um, subsidence in many places that can be controlled by the water table, other things like that. The other thing which you can do is you can increase the volume of the oceans. So it can go up because you just simply dump more water into the bathtub. So thermal expansion can increase the water. You heat it up, and so it expands. And then of course you can melt ice sheets and glaciers, add that volume to the oceans. There is some contribution from groundwater, although it's very hard to say for exactly what that contribution would be in the general water cycle as a whole. 
but probably the ice sheets and glaciers are one of the largest contributors to increasing the mass of the ocean. And then finally, and this is something that we should always remember because it tends to be very important regionally, is you can slosh water from one place in the ocean to the other. So you can think of this as being internal variability because the ice sheets are massive gravitationally mountains, they can attract and release water and change the actual shape of the earth to this thing called sea level fingerprints where sea level is not distributed equally across the globe. Okay, so those are kind of the major things that control sea level. And so the next question that you might think is how much will sea level rise? Or equivalently, what are the rates at which sea level can rise? And this is a rather complicated graph, but it is essentially trying to show you the range of sea level projections from roughly 2020 out to 2150. And these little dots are showing you different projections and the arrows uh, or sort of the, the bars above them are showing the range. And so you're sort of seeing where most of the projections are along with a few of the outliers. This data is taken from a combination of the IPCC, the recent interagency sea level rise report, um, and then a couple of other sources. And so you might come up with something that looks slightly different, but in terms of global sea level rise, I think you'll come up with something that looks generally the same. And so 2020, we have a pretty good idea of what that is, depending on what a reference period is, that might be zero or, um, um, but we have pretty good idea of what it is. There's very small bars there, the rectangles are pretty small because we have pretty good observational constraints on what that is. As we go out to the next 30 years or so, the projections start to diverge a little bit, but you can think of 2050 as having on the order of say 25 centimeters or so, give or take. As we start building out towards 2060, 2070, the range is getting bigger and bigger until we get to about 2100, where roughly the estimated sea level rise might be on the order of a meter. Again, that's global sea level rise, not local sea level rise, with fairly large potential variability. So some of these simulations are actually showing close to a meter and a half of sea level rise. Some of these simulations are showing, in fact, just tens of centimeters of sea level rise. So the question is, independent of, of scenario depend independent of scenario dependence, no. So what I'm showing you is the range of sea level rise. We're going to talk about that a little bit more at the dependence of the scenario. Um, if you just simply ask the question of what is the range of potential fates that people have projected, then this is roughly showing you what it is. Um, and we're going to break that down into actually the different components shortly. Um, by the time you get up to 2150, these bars are huge um, and range from close to a few tens of centimeters all the way up to three or four meters of sea level rise. So, of course, global sea level rise isn't really what you want. What you really want is regional sea level rise. And here, overlaid on the global sea level rise, I'm showing you in a graph that is quite difficult to actually, <laughs> regional sea level rise is not easy to compute. Um, so there's a little bit of black magic and unreliability in this. But what you can see is that generally the highs and the lows expand. And up until about 2050, again, still 25 centimeters-ish, you get a little bit more in some places, a little bit less in other places. Um, again, because subsidence and uplift really does matter. As you get out to 2100, the scenarios start to diverge quite a bit. And now we're starting to see more negative sea level rise along with um, potentially larger sea level rise in some places, some places um, close to three meters by 2100 and some places close to, to, to losing about a meter. And again, this, these numbers are starting to reflect the imprint of sea level fingerprints and the fact there's a pretty large regional variability. So when we say one meter of sea level rise global, it has huge disparities locally. 
on different communities. And the strategies that you would have to adapt to say 50 centimeters of sea level rise versus one and a half meters of sea level rise can be quite different. And that just continues to expand as we get out past um, 2100 into 2150. So, Jeremy, can I introduce for a second? There's a, appears to be a question from Heiko in the chat. Um, I don't know if you would. Um, if we, yeah, if so I, I mentioned that in my answers that it, it is currently, I'm not breaking down individual scenarios, but we're about to go through that and actually look at the different scenarios. So, this is simply saying, okay, here's the range of projections. And being a glaciologist, I am not going to tell you what emission scenario we are. Um, but these are the range of, of potential futures that people have forecasted. Okay. There's no breakdown in terms of weighting it by particular scenarios. Um, and so that's really the next question is which of these paths are we on? Because it makes a huge difference if we're on this multi-meter sea level rise, or perhaps out to five meters of sea level rise. When you think about a community that's within five to 10 meters of sea level rise total. And if you think about the strategies involved in either protecting a city like New York, a major city, um, it leads to very, very different short term solutions. So I think this is kind of getting into this question. And so I'm going to show this in a very weird way. It's a way that I've kind of grown to like because it's been done in climate models for a number of regions. But it's very confusing when you first look at it. Um, so what I'm trying to show you is the fractional uncertainty. So how much of that spread is due to different components? So you can break it down as I've done here into internal variability. That's essentially the sloshing of the ocean from one place to another. Regional variability, again, uplift, things that we don't know about uplift, subsidence, things like that. Model uncertainty. <coughs> which reflects fundamental processes that we may or may not understand, and scenario uncertainty, what the climate forcing is going to do. And the truth is, this graph is um, a work in progress. And how you actually break the uncertainty down into these different components is a little bit subjective. And so in this case, pretty much all of the climate forcing is going to get shoved into scenario uncertainty. So for a given scenario, emission scenario, some models are going to be hot, some models are going to be cold, and all that is being kind of shoved into that scenario uncertainty. Equivalently, internal variability and regional variability are intrinsically connected. Um, and you could think about whether you want to think about surface mass balance as part of the model uncertainty or the scenario uncertainty. And so there's all kinds of different ways of breaking this down. But what I want to highlight in this is that Largely speaking, however you break it down, internal variability, that kind of tens of centimeter of sloshing back and forth over kind of five to 10 years, really is the dominant source of uncertainty up until about 2050. So the fact that your sea level can go up and down by eight to 20 ish centimeters is a big deal for how you decide to adapt over those short timeframes and whether which of these phases you're in. Regional uncertainty um, is generally not huge under the assumption that we can accurately calculate sea level fingerprints and things. And keep in mind that this is not telling you how big that uncertainty is. And the uncertainty gets larger as you get out to larger timescales. And so the regional uncertainty becomes larger in a quantitative way, um, because we simply don't know where the mass is coming from in the different scenarios. <coughs> but as we extend out towards 2100 and even towards 2150, it's really that scenario uncertainty and that model uncertainty that start to dominate things. So if you think about it, the emissions scenario is really going to control the long-term uncertainty out from 2150, it actually increases dramatically. The internal variability is going to control what you need to do for your short term projections and kind of in between we have model physics, how we parameterize different processes that can start to play a more fundamental role. And again, what distribution you get between these different terms depends a little bit on how you decide to partition these different uncertainties. So if we think about the really big scenarios of sea level rise 
and we're interested in either ruling them out or deciding that these are likely, then there are two big instabilities that we need to deal with. And the first of these is called the marine ice sheet instability. It was first proposed in the 1970s. It was controversial. Belief in the marine ice sheet instability wax and wane, kind of like the ice sheets themselves. And it's generally believed that it's driven by dissipation of gravitational potential energy through viscous deformation. And the idea is if you have an ice sheet in which the separation between the grounded portion and the floating portion called the grounding line, if that grounding line gets deeper on what we call a retrograde bed, then because the thinning rate of the grounding line depends on the ice thickness to a power, <coughs> you have an instability in which once you start to retreat, you can potentially catastrophically retreat and expose more and more floating ice as that grounding line retreats into deeper and thicker bed region. There's another instability that's been recently proposed called the marine ice cliff instability. Marine ice cliff instability is stabilized by dissipation of gravitational potential energy, unlike the marine ice instability, which is that if you thin the ice more, then you are less likely to get this marine ice cliff instability because the ice stiff cliff instability basically says, if I build a cliff that's too tall, the ice isn't strong enough to support it and it will collapse. Now, if the ice is thicker upstream, you're exposing thicker and thicker ice. So that's more and more likely to collapse. And so you have potential for this instability in which these things can just shoot off and catastrophically retreat as the ice thickness gets thicker upstream. Dream. Now, unlike the marine ice sheet instability, which we've observed in action, I don't know that there's any observations to support the marine ice cliff instability. It was initially proposed by myself and Catherine Walker based purely on a back of the envelope calculation um, in which we pointed out that the cliffs can't get too high, otherwise it's a real problem. Um, but later, DeCanto and Pollard incorporated into model and actually found out that they thought that it could be a relevant process. Crucially though, you need to get rid of your ice shells first before you allow either of these instabilities. So the thing that is protecting the Antarctic ice sheet from massive retreat is really these freely floating masses of ice that fringe around it. So this is a somewhat older figure <coughs> on the right from Eric Rigno, and you're seeing the ice shelves and the color is colored by melt rate, um, actually really accumulation rate. So the dark reds are higher melt rates, the blues are accumulating mass, and the circles in the different colors are representing what fraction of that mass is lost by either basal melting or iceberg capping. And you know, just to kind of think about this a little bit more, basal melting is considered is driven by ocean warming, which is then again related to the climate system. So again, all of this could factor into either ice sheet model uncertainty, if you want to think of it that way, or actually scenario uncertainty. And just for interest, if you look all the way um, over here in East Antarctica, there you have Conger. That's the ice shelf that recently disintegrated, possibly in response to a exceptional atmospheric river event. Again, would that be in emission or model physics uncertainty? Don't know. And then the image on the left is showing the Larsen B ice shelf, which disintegrated in 2002 and is believed to be related to the fact that you piled on a ton of surface water, melt water on the ice sheet. Critically, neither of these events were predicted by models and is, is the way in a lot of ice sheet modeling, what we end up doing is going and seeing things after the fact and then trying to figure out what happened in what I like to call um, in what I like to call a little bit of forensic glaciology. And thanks, Chris. And so we can also look to the amounts and sea embayments. That's where all you have these dark red splots. That's where we've observed, people have observed a lot of increased basal melt rate. And this is a lovely MOA image, which I love the way NASA produced it on the right, showing Pine Island kind of feeding in here. And this is an animation, which I particularly like from Steph Lermite in his 2020 um, 20 paper, looking at the shear margins 
And what you're noticing for Pine Island is that this ice shelf is advancing. You can see these shear margins, which look kind of granular and all this crazy stuff going on. And then of course, you're throwing off these tabular bergs, causing the Pine Island ice shelf to retreat. The concern of course, is that if Pine floating portions continue to retreat, you eventually retreat, you expose a thick cliff and you could trigger something like the marine ice cliff instability. Similarly in Thwaites, which is maybe the place where people have the most interest, here is an image showing Thwaites Glacier. Um, Thwaites Glacier in the MOA image is kind of over here in the lower right-hand portion of it. And you can just see that this is incredibly broken up. The ice is advancing past the grounding line. There's this massive fracturing that's happening. And it remains an open question how much longer that sucker is going to hold on before this ice starts to really break up and expose a, the grounding line. So if you want to think about kind of these different scenarios, probably the first thing we want to know is, well, surface mass balance and things like the ocean forcing, but also can we actually predict when these different ice shelves are going to go? When will we get these big tabular bergs? When will we get these disintegration type events? And so we've been working on this for a little while now, and you can do it in a lot of different ways. The particular model that I'm trying to use here really just incorporates fraction in a very simple way in which we essentially account for dislocation creep, diffusion creep. Um, and then once the ice exceeds some kind of yield strength, the strength, the stress can increase anymore. We assume that it's yielded and we decrease the viscosity. We can use this to reproduce different types of regimes and use different types of yield envelopes. So first simulation I wanna show you is a very idealized ice shelf. So it's about 40 kilometer wide. That's about the width of kind of the main trunk of Pine Island, about 80 kilometers long. It's got embayment on both sides. The ice is going to go from left to right using what we call a shallow shelf approximation and incorporating this failure of ice. And what I want to show you is this panel on the right is top panel is going to show you ice thickness and bottom panel is gonna essentially show you where you have fractures. So the yellow colors are fractures. And on, I'm showing you a tabular berg that broke off of Peterman in Greenland, because this is a phenomenon that affects both Greenland and Antarctica. And what you see is the ice is kind of pushing out, advancing, and we're getting these episodic detachment of tabular bergs, somewhat similar to observations. Again, somewhat um, idealized, very idealized simulation. And if anyone ever tries to show you simulations of fracture and ice and rifting and things like that, um, always ask to see the second calving event. Because one of the problems that we have with a lot of these simulations is you get the first calving event, your rift looks perfect. It might even reproduce observations that people have. And then the entire idea or ice sheet will disintegrate because the models tend to be much more brittle than real ice is. Or you end up with a calving event, a butyl rip pull rifting event, and then the entire ice shelf is stable and you never get anything else. So at least here we're showing that you can reproduce a quasi-stable position. Okay, next thing that we did is apply this exact same model just to the floating portion of Pine Island holding the ice thickness constant at the grounding line using measures data set, um, thickness is constant. Now the ice grounding line is retreating, there's kind of interesting dynamics and the big bad ice sheet upstream really makes a difference. The mentally an ice sheet shelf person. So we're gonna forget about that and just kind of try and look at what the simulations would look like. Again, we get these large calving events and these tabular calving events and retreat of Pine Island Glacier up to kind of close to a more retreated position than it currently is. Um, actually, at, for this particular simulation, the grounding line is a little upstream of the current grounding line and kind of retreats up to close to the grounding line. All right, we can do more simulations. And in fact, I think at this point, we've done close to 50 to 100 simulations. And one of the things that's interesting about these is this is a different realization um, in this case, we're using a slightly different initial condition and a different ocean forcing. Um, and one of the things that we find is that Pine Island in all of our simulations either retreats in most of them 
or it advances up into this past its geometry and would kind of continue to advance. And in this case, you're seeing this rifting from this central portion where it forms this pinning point. Um, and for various reasons associated with our melt forcing, it kind of gets stuck there. So the potential here is that what we're seeing is Pine Island could potentially retreat. And at least in these simulations, that is going to happen within the next 30 to 70 years or so. Um, either a relatively rapid retreat in which you kind of retreat close to the ground line within the next 20 to 30, or depending on the ocean forcing and atmospheric forcing in a slightly longer time frame. And so that provides the potential to expose a thick cliff, at which point you have potential for a marine ice cliff instability. So these are simulations that we did from a little over a year or two ago now, in which we use the exact same model. Um, although we had to make the ice a little bit stronger in this case. And instead of looking at it in a map view, you're looking at a cross section in which we have a constant slope bed and then a surface slope. And you're looking at the vertical dependence. And we get similar type of behavior to what you see in modern day outlet glaciers in Greenland, in which we get these episodic bergs that detach. And notice that the time scales in days as opposed to years now, causing this glacier to retreat. Um, but one of the interesting things that we found is that if you essentially, you know, just lean hand on it, put a little bit of buttressing, then instead of getting retreat, you can actually get at least temporary readvance or stabilization. And in fact, if we do a whole bunch more simulations in which we vary how much, how quickly you're pushing in the ice from upstream, or equivalently, or, or just sort of sorry, and at the same time, we change the thickness gradient. That's how quickly it gets thicker upstream. We found that we could get two, three potential regimes. One is if you pushed an ice through fast enough and the ice was pretty, had a pretty small thickness gradient, then irrespective of whether it was on a retrograde slope or prograde slope, you could get it to advance. If you didn't push it hard enough upstream, you would end up with retreat. Um, but once the thickness gradient exceeded a critical threshold, we would get collapse with retreat rates on the order of 20 to 40 kilometers or more. And so the argument here is that we really need to know what the shape of the bed is as much as any of the model physics to really understand what's going on in the future. And just for interest, I put this square here where Thwaites sits, which indicates if in our simulations, if you were to get rid of the any buttressing, just expose that cliff, you'd end up with retreat on the order of within the range of variability in our simulations, about one to two kilometers, about the same as um, Dockersoven in modern day Greenland. Okay, so we have all of these things and different factors, we could then go through and say, okay, well, what about all the other different physics that we don't know? What about surface melt? What about surface mass balance? Um, but I want to come back at just at the end of this talk to the original question that I posed to you, which is when do we expect to exceed one meter in New York City? And I suppose the right answer is, well, what emission scenario are we on? Are we on a RCP 8.5 scenario? Are we on an RCP 2 point, no, I'm forgetting all the numbers now, um, 2.6 scenario or 2.5 scenario, because um, of course that makes a difference. But when I talk to planners and adaptation, they're like, well, I don't know what scenario we're gonna be on. We need to plan for whatever the most realistic scenario is. And so working with a number of people in different communities, we've been kind of adapting this from Moss and Schneider, and we've been thinking of it from a slightly different way, which is, I'm showing you a graph here in which we have on the x-axis, essentially the amount of evidence, observations, model output, theory, all of the kind of different things that we can assemble. This could include paleo, IPCC reports. And then on this axis, oops, on the um, y-axis, I have level of consensus or agreement. So essentially saying, is all of the peer-reviewed literature in agreement or not? And so things that fall into this lower left box are speculative. Things that fall in this 
upper right box are things that are fairly well established. And it's kind of going through this type of things. You can think of things as being kind of closer or further away from this dividing line. But it's this type of analysis that I found especially useful in communicating to different adaptation professionals how much we really know and how much is perhaps a single study. So just like we started with, just work through in the last kind of two or three, five minutes of this talk, I want to work through a couple of potential examples. Um, sea level, question which I'll ask you, and I'll put it in the chat. Um, sea level is going to rise in the next century. And I'll ask you to put in the chat whether you think that is well established, established but incomplete, speculative, competing explanations. So sea level is going to rise in the next century. Go ahead, enter into the chat where you think that should fall on this particular type of graph. Well-established, well-established, well-established. Okay, so this is kind of a baseline well-established. This is an easy one, right? Um, a baseline set of knowledge essentially says, okay, if I go to a community, sea level rise is gonna continue to rise. It's going to continue to rise most likely over the next century. And we have overwhelming evidence, theories, observations that tell us that. So doing nothing is much worse than doing the wrong thing. Okay, let's try and do something that's more difficult. Sea level rise will rise by one meter. Global, let's do global sea level rise. Um, of course, the, it's the regional that really matters, but global sea level rise will re rise by one meter between 2100 and 2050. I'll again, type that in. And so where does that sit? Again, well established, established but incomplete. What about the rest of you? Y'all are taking your time to uh, to think about this. Established but incomplete, competing explanations. Okay. Established but incomplete. Established but incomplete. Okay, so we're somewhere, it looks like, in established but incomplete or competing explanations. And I think it kind of depends on wh where you're weighting consensus versus the consensus of models. Um, speculative, okay. Um, competing. Okay, interesting. So we're somewhere in the, either the, we're, 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 we are um, not well established, but somewhere in established but incomplete speculative competing explanations. And it seems like the majority of you in this particular group um, think perhaps established but incomplete or competing explanations. So something that we should think about, especially for high risk infrastructure planning for, but maybe not something that is we're sure is going to happen. Okay, let's just do a couple more. Um, marine ice sheet instability. Established but incomplete, well-established, speculative, competing explanations. Established but incomplete, established but incomplete. Established but incomplete. We're starting to get a consensus for established but incomplete. Established but incomplete. Okay, this is actually really interesting because I did a similar exercise solely with a bunch of ice sheet modelers. And their view was that this was well-established, um, 
But here I think that there's a little bit more debate and perhaps more nuance associated with the fact that marine ice sheet instability is perhaps best thought of as a one-dimensional thing, whereas the reality of the nuance of the embayment. All right, last one. And I'm pretty sure I know what the answer is to this one, but let's just go through it as well. Marine ice cliff instability. Speculative. Speculative. Um, so a consensus towards speculative right now. Does anybody want to disagree? Nobody so far? Okay, so all of these type of exercise kind of allow us to plot the different scenarios on a scenario on a way of visualizing it for adaptation professionals that is sometimes a little bit easier than the IPCC level of um, very likely, likely, which has this very rigorous understanding and definitions, but is super hard to communicate to a lot of people. And so once we start explaining that some of these scenarios are fairly speculative, it establishes a level of trust in terms of what scenario we should plan for. And it's entirely possible that some infrastructure decisions need to be based on fairly speculative theories simply because of the level of risk. Um, but we can also start to establish infrastructure decisions based on things that we all agree of are well established. Um, and if we're being honest that as scientists, the things that we're most excited to study as scientists are often the things that lie here in the lower left quadrant, right? Speculative. Those are the things we really want to study. Those are the things we want our students to study. Well established, there's not a lot of interest in kind of doing new PhD projects or scientific studies, kind of just incrementally advancing those things. Although those are the things that need to be explained to our communities. So I just kind of want to leave it here, which that is that the adaptation decisions really need to be driven by science. So scientists need to be part of those decisions, but we can't ignore equity and most of the adaptation at the community level decisions that we need to make need to involve community members, need to involve communication with community member, members, and need to involve both lawyers to tell us what is actually possible and engineers to tell us what is possible and social scientists to tell us actually how to do it. And with that, I would like to end and I'll take a few questions. Thank you all for playing along um, as I tortured you with a number of questions. Um, thanks, everyone. Uh, thanks, Jeremy. I, I particularly enjoyed the um, the audience interaction. That was that was a lot of fun. Um, do, do we have any Do we have any questions uh, from anyone? You can uh, raise your hand or or, or um, post something in the chat there. Looks like there's a question from Chris. Do you want to unmute yourself if you can, or um... Yep, sure, Jeremy. Um, one of the things that uh, when Steph was putting that paper together uh, on Pine Island and Thwaites was, was unmistakable was the uh, um, disaggregation, uh, uh, the, the essentially the uh, uh, increased fracturing of, of the ice moving forward. This is especially true of Thwaites because it is less constrained. Um, and and it, uh, one of the reasons that I, I'm asking the question is because that is very difficult to model even with all the tools in the, in, in the toolbox right now um, uh, um, is, is the, the ice is simply uh, um, like the front of the scar inlet remnant of the Larson B. Uh, uh, when that finally blew out uh, earlier this year, the ice was, was not coherent. Uh, it, it was literally uh, barely holding, holding together. So uh, can you speak to how to handle that kind of uncertainty in the, the actual uh, characteristics of the ice uh, uh, becoming less stable as we go forward in time? Thanks. 
Yeah, I mean, that's an excellent question. So um, if I were to break down model physics into things that I think are the least certain, one of the things that I would put in there is the evolution of shear margins, because that's largely what's holding ice back. And once those go, you're exposing the rest of the ice to larger stresses, you're making it more likely to fracture. Um, in terms of your question about how would we actually model that, now, there's an interesting thing here, which is that um, a lot of the models that we do kind of naturally produce that fragmented, weak um, shear margin. Now, here's the problem that I have right now is we end up with two scenarios, one where you don't get shear margins, they're not weak enough, and the other in which our shear margins basically detach from the side and they're not quite strong enough to provide any shear stress or resistance. Um, and so I think that that disarticulation of the ice is a critical process, and um, it involves the fact that we get these, you know, smaller chunks of ice that are disarticulated that we need to deal with in a more sophisticated way. Um, but I think this is the kind of thing that, you know, within the next five years or so, we can figure out how to do it. Um, I think we're only starting to get the observations and the technology about to simulate those types of things. But thanks for the question. I believe um, next we have, um, sorry. There's a question in the chat from Lori. You're the expert. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure that I'm the expert in anything anymore. What's the correct categorization of um, marine ice cliff instability? So I will answer that. Um, speculative, and but speculative in a way that I sort of avoid the deep uncertainty terminology that some people like in very testable and rectifiable ways. What we really don't know is what the strength of the ice is. If we can understand that, then it's no longer speculative. It's something that we can simulate with fairly decent accuracy. I, I believe next is, uh, is Jeff. Hi, I've got a, um, uh, question about whether it's worth saving New York. Is it, unless you're going to build um, Dutch style dikes or, or in the case of um, London, somewhere like the Thames Barrier, I mean, can you actually do anything like that for New York or should we just have managed retreat? Um, so this is a great question. I think it's also one of the ones that really require um, someone from New York, uh, the community members to answer, for some dude from sitting outside Detroit to say, no, we should abandon New York. My ancestral homeland is probably not the right approach. Um, and the, the way I would think about it is a little bit different. I would say what we want to think about is <clears throat> phases. What can we do by 2050? Because you are not going to abandon New York within the next 30 years. Um, what does New York look like in a way that's livable in a way in which we protect the most vulnerable people. What does it look like by 2100? Maybe it involves retreating parts of that island. There's this proposal I just read to massively expand lower Manhattan to protect it against sea level rise. So basically you just jut it way out there and make it this huge, huge thing. I've read proposals for barriers, but you really need, um, uh, yeah, I mean, Gavin pointed out there's a lot more valuable real estate in the cost for barrier system. Yeah, I, I mean, this is not a thing. This is a, a thing that requires New Yorkers to get together and decide. And what, is, what does the barrier system look like? Who does it protect? Who does? And if you're thinking about New York, what the heck happens to New Jersey? Because a barrier system, it doesn't just affect New York, it's going to affect New Jersey as well. So those are all excellent questions that are go beyond the science. But great question. Um, next, we have. Um... Joe, I, I just mentioned it. I just noticed that Klaus put his hand up. I think he's perhaps a bit of an expert on, on, on uh, management retreat. If, if you have a comment directly, it might be appropriate. Yeah, I have a comment, not so much on the retreat, even so it results eventually in retreat, uh, but on the barrier system. The barrier systems are not sustainable because <clears throat> eventually sea level rise will be high enough that you practically have to close the barriers all the time. If you do that, the Hudson floods from behind the Raritan River. So they are not useful for sea level rise. They buy you time on the decadal level, but not on the century level. 
Yeah, and that's a great comment because that's why I think that it's important. I'm often asked, what sea level rise going to be in by X years or something like that, right? And the truth is, right, those answers really depend on the range of infrastructure decisions that, it, that experts can tell you are actually useful. Um, and so science just by itself doesn't really tell you anything about that. Um, let's see, so there was a question in the chat. What observables could provide early warning systems of MISI and, and Mickey? Um, marine ice cliff instability and a much faster sea level rise than the likely range. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Something that we've been thinking about in my group and in other groups a lot. Um, and here's the reality of it is that even for our most extreme models, we still have decades of warning before some of the more extreme scenarios. Um, even once marine ice cliff instability starts to initiate, if it initiates, we still have a few decades. And so um, in general, better satellite imagery, so we can see places like Conger disintegrating, would be extraordinarily useful. More frequent images and higher resolution images of the fractures that are the precursors would be useful. Um, but it's not like a, a hurricane where you, or kind of extreme weather where it suddenly happens. Sea level rise is going to slowly progress. And I think it's likely that in a couple of decades, we're gonna know better and better and better which emission scenario we're on and what the impacts of that are gonna be. Uh, thank you. I, I think next we have, uh, Lauren has a hand up and then um, I think we're gonna to go to Chris. Yeah, thanks, uh, Jeremy. Very, very interesting talk, and I really um, enjoy, especially your framework of uh, way of thinking about um, various processes and how well established they are. And yeah, you, speculative um, projections are very useful in some for, for some planning. So it's, uh, it's it's important to do that work. And um, I'm thinking actually of the cases where we might be overconfident, maybe, in and saying some things are well established as a community because since we're all humans, right, before being scientists and um, have cognitive bias, maybe, you know, confirming things that the community as a whole is thinking. What, what do you think about that and, and how, how we can avoid that the community be more critical? Yeah, I mean, so that's a, that is an excellent question. Um, my views on this, I think, largely diverge from most of the modeling, the ice sheet modeling community at this point. Um, but I think it is a real problem that we have ice sheet models that have largely failed to predict any of the major changes that we've seen in Antarctica and Greenland before they actually happened. So we didn't predict the Larsen B disintegrate. We didn't predict the retreat of Jakobshaven. We didn't predict the acceleration of the grounding line of Pine Island and Thwaites, all of those things. We didn't predict Conger. We didn't predict all of these things, right? So my view on this is that the amount of confidence you should have in a model or a projection should be based on the number of observations that it has been able to predict. And you know, there's people who are very passionate about predict versus project, right? Um, but what we really wanna do is to be in a situation in which we have enough confidence in our models to say, I think Pine Island ice shelf is going to disintegrate um, or retreat within the next seven, so many decades, or Thwaites will retreat or disintegrate by this particular date. And this is what's going to happen afterwards. So we're in a position where we've actually made predictions in which we can say, okay, the model wasn't right. This tells us that we need to improve the model. Um, so I think that that's kind of the framework um, that we need to think of that. Um, so Gavin has a, a comment on that. Aren't these all, and we don't have routine couple climate dynamic ice sheets ready to go. So that's true, right? So the ice sheet coupling and even solid earth coupling aren't entirely mature yet. So we should be a little bit reluctant in how confident we are. Nonetheless, there's a whole bunch of things that we can be confident in that we really have just established as conventions. The exponent in Glenn's flow law. I use three in all the simulations. Recent papers have suggested, uh, you know, maybe that should be four. But that's a prediction that can be easily verified with observations. Um, can we reproduce the fate of, or kind of the broad retreat of Greenland's hundreds of green of outlet glaciers? There's all kinds of stuff here in terms of the climate coupling that I think is also really, really important and hard to deal with, right? Atmospheric rivers are things that people are thinking about, but kind of that energy is lofted in through MJO type cycles. And then 
you know, atmospheric scientists and meteorologists use like QBO and all these other cycles I don't really quite understand to channel the Rosby waves. And so all of those things are important. And I think that to the extent that we can start predicting some of those things, not the exact time of every calving event or atmospheric river or surface mass balance, but the general trends, then I think we'll be a little bit more confident. And I think we can link that with paleo. Paleo is not perfect. The time scales are hard, but it tells us a lot of constraints about when things disappeared. Um, and I think really making sure our models do their best to explain modern observations and paleo observations will give us a lot more confident that the things we've tuned for in modern climate actually still apply in a very different climate regime. Again, nothing perfect. Okay, thank you. Um, I think next I was going to ask Chris if if um, if he would like to uh, say something, and and then we have we have Gavin next. Yeah, I, I, I just wanted to give people who aren't shelf watchers, um, that's kind of a term that I use for a number of us uh, who collaborate on events. Uh, um, I wanted to illustrate Pine Island's more constrained flow versus Thwaites, you know, uh, uh, highly fractured output uh, using some recent MODIS images. And I knew it was a clear day because uh, there's actually a pretty good Landsat 8 uh, uh, image on the, the 19th of February uh, over at Thwaites. Um, but but I, I, I do want to echo the coupled nature of this in that we had multiple uh, um, losses of uh, uh, glacial ice from several locations around Antarctica in part because it was a uniquely low sea ice year around Antarctica. And so that is a, a much bigger uh, a climate uh, um, um, system impact than, than is necessarily what's impacting an individual glacier. Land glacier lost a lot of its uh, 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 ice crumbles uh, that were uh, uh, caught in long-term sea ice um, uh, close, to the, close to the corner with uh, the Ross Ice Shelf. We've already talked about uh, the Conger Glenzer breakdown, uh, um, uh, but also some uh, um, ice, uh, fast ice that had lasted more than a decade uh, blew out of the Larsen B embayment this year. And then soon thereafter, uh, the, the glacial ice, which had been moving down flow, uh, um, got caught in a, a pretty big storm and got blown, uh, got blown out to sea. So there's, there's definitely a bigger picture uh, uh, as well as these local um, events that, that make the news. So uh, um, uh, that's, that's all I wanted to add, thanks. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, what I would say is all of these things are things that we can put in kind of this framework of speculative, well-established and kind of think about how well we know this, those processes. So that's kind of generally my answer for a lot of these things. How well do we understand this? How well do we know it? Um, how much observational evidence is there? And once we have that, then if you can generate testable hypotheses, then we can kind of start thinking about how to incorporate that in a better, in a more systematic way in, in models. Right. And uh, yeah, uh, Gavin, yeah, I don't really even understand what the MGO is. All I know is that whenever I talk to tropical meteorologists, they appear to speak in three, uh, three letter acronyms. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, I, I, uh, I, 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 I hear you, but, but you really don't need to worry about the MGO. Um, uh, so, but th that wasn't going to be my, my question. Um, I, so I was, going to, I was going to talk more about this kind of sociology of model building. Um, so, I mean, as, as you're well aware, uh, the Mickey uh, parameterization in the De Conto and Pollard um, runs was put in because they did not validate well against uh, paleoclimate. Uh, change, right? And they needed something, anything that would make things more sensitive, right? And they and they 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 chose this, um, and then you know got a better match to uh, was it was it the last interglacial? I'm, I, I I forget. Um, I, and then kind of used that to go forward. But the uh, uh, but the fact is, they could have picked almost anything. That would have made their ice sheets more sensitive. They could have changed uh, the basal sliding rule. They could have changed the rheology. They could have like there was there was there was a um, uh, the, 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 and they might have put in other processes. Um, and so the 
uh, the projection that we have from those kinds of models uh, is kind of modulo the choice that they had for putting in, you know, uh, some extra physics. And the, the change for today might well be quite different had they chosen a different path to get the last interglacial to fit better. Right. So, so there's a, there's a, uh, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, you have a, a particular interest in the specific mechanism, um, but but the reason why they chose that mechanism over any other mechanism is kind of ad hoc, right? So it's, um, uh, so. What we what we really want to know is, you know, what's the uh, what's the integrated risk going forward, integrating over all the possible things that one could have chosen to get a better match to the paleoclimate. And I don't know that we're uh, that we're that we're ever <laughs> uh, that we're ever uh, going to be able to do that. Yeah, I mean, so there's there's two different aspects to that. One is from what you want to do from a policy or planning standpoint in a community engagement one, which is clearly marine ice limb instability, whatever your feelings on it, it remains in the speculative range. Um, and that needs to factor forward in terms of, we are not sure that we are on this pathway. <laughs> um, if you need to have this high risk pathway, then there are multiple ways in which we can produce sea level rise that are comparable, um, which doesn't actually necessarily, which makes it a slightly different risk question than, your, than one way or another, and, but it still doesn't quite get rid of it is that we still have this potential in which our models need additional processes to match previous um, sea level rise. But I guess the question which I would do is I would generally say, okay, this is all true. What I would say is what we wanna turn it around and say is what are the predictable hypotheses, um, testable hypotheses that we can make? Because I don't honestly think marine ice cliff instability is that hard to test and decide that it really is not going to be a big deal um, because we have first principles, fundamental theories that allow us to tell, prop, to tell you exactly where the fractures are going to go and when they're going to propagate. And the tuning knobs in all those models is essentially how strong is ice, right? And if you assume that it is what we did in our 2012 paper, it's a possibility, although as we pointed out in kind of the recent um, 2021 paper, the temperature of the ice and other things also matter quite a bit, and it's not likely to be a sustained retreat. You can also imagine that you get other factors, um, different sliding laws that will also evolve differently. So I don't think I've actually answered your question, except that you know, if we don't understand the sliding law, we don't understand how ice fractures, we don't understand how shear margins evolve, we shouldn't have an awful lot of confidence in that our models are going to do the right thing in the future when all of those things are likely to change. And the terrible reality right now is that most of our models are tuned to reproduce modern conditions, right. which will not necessarily be representative of what's going to happen in a decade or two decades or a hundred years from now. Right. I mean, so, so, I mean, I've, 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 I've been a, a proponent of people uh, using paleoclimate uh, changes um, as a uh, as a test bed for their future projections for for many many years, um, and uh, and I think that uh, you know the the ice sheet modelers I think understand that uh, quite well. Um, but the uh, the problem is is that we don't have that many degrees of freedom to uh, to calibrate the the models to. Uh, at the at the level that you would need to calibrate them, so that you could be confident that your projections going forward were uh, all that were, were 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 capturing the true uh, uncertainty that we have, given that we've matched, you know, the the last interglacial and the deglaciation, and uh, you know maybe uh, maybe a Heinrich event or two. I mean, like, what we what we would like would be to to be able to test all of those things and then have a, a kind of you know a Monte Carlo method, uh, looking at all those different uh, looking at all that different structural uncertainty, and then just picking picking the ones that uh, that do the best in terms of the uh, uh, the paleo climate to to carry forward and uh, imbue with confidence. Um, but it seems to me we're a long way from that. Yeah, I mean, I guess I'll, 
this seems like a very much longer conversation. <laughs> Um, especially because I'm getting a little bit hungry for lunch. But I, what I would say is, um, is, is, yes, I think I agree with everything. But I think no matter what happens, the model physics isn't going to really make a big difference until kind of 2050 or so. Um, and then out past 2100, you're increasingly going to be dealing with the fact that your emission scenario and your climate uncertainty is going to be this gigantic bell that you can't unring until you figure out which of those paths you're on. Um, and there's this in-between region that's super important in which we need to figure out what that physics is. And I will not tell you it's not important because it's what I work on. Uh, um, but even if we had that perfectly, we'd still have this large uncertainty associated with what, on, what scenario we think we're going to be on. And the other question is, I do think there's a whole bunch of things that we can do to discard models that are not feasible. And I think there's actually more information that we can use that we have generally been shy from using because it's really, really difficult. We actually have reproduction, reproductions of grounding lines and my, grounding line migration. All of that is constraints of whether a model is doing the right thing. Um, we have constraints on iceberg size and things like that, which is super crude, especially in the paleo, because it's just based on, you know, plow marks. But it's all stuff that is not zero information. It might not be high value. We have information about the plumbing system to tell us how the hydrology has evolved. And again, that's all information that we can use. It's just not easy to use. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, plenty of work to be done. <laughs> Thank you, though. Good questions. Uh, thanks, thanks, Kevin. I hope you guys uh, don't mind that uh, I let things overrun. I, I was, we were uh, lovely conversations going on. Um, do we have any, perhaps we should save final um, questions at this point, seeing as we have overrun by around 15 minutes. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, Jeremy. That was a, that was a great talk um, on uh, multiple levels. So, uh, we well, I'd like to thank everyone for me and um, <laughs> and and actually putting up with virtual me, uh, which I've been told is much easier than than real physical me. <laughs> and um, I hope everyone has a uh, good rest of your afternoon. Thank I enjoyed you. the uh, the experience. Great. Well, we'll see you again soon. Hopefully. Uh, thank, uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us. And uh, yeah, as Jeremy said, uh, have a great day. <laughs>